Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching or listening to public comment. You're either watching the video blog or listening to the podcast. And I've got some interesting things to chat with you about today. I will be talking about my t attempts to acquaint myself with technology, something I'm not very good at. But um, was it Aristotle who said that learning is pain? And it is what it is sometimes with respect to that. I will also be chatting with you about how it is we determine what in life is interesting to us. And I'll be talking to you about friendship. And uh, I'll be injecting in my chat on friendship a little bit on the debate between globalism and nationalism, and specifically where the conversation about free trade versus protectionism is concerned. But I want to begin now with this whole uh, technology thing. So, okay, to begin with, I've got a lot going on here. So I've got my smartphone on a tripod. And I'm broadcasting live on Facebook. And I'm doing it this way for a few reasons. So, you see, it's all about this um, experimental thing that I'm doing here. I did have this live streaming software. I do have this particular live streaming software. It's called ManyCam. And what's really awesome about ManyCam is that I can stream live and then I can, while I'm streaming live, I can actually put in captions, I can make effects, I can go from various cameras, and there's a lot I can do with it. However, because my cell phone camera doesn't connect with it very well, that's not working out so hot. Uh, moreover, it turns out that I can get a better overall picture by using my smartphone camera than I can the webcam on my laptop. So it is what it is for now until I figure out how to do this a little bit better. I'll tell you another thing. So I have this really awesome video editing software. I have this, uh, it's called Wondershare Filmora 9. And what's really cool about it is that, I mean, you can do a lot of editing. It's a decent software if you're not rich and can't afford, you know, Final Cut Pro or the Adobe software. On the other hand, if you want the top quality video and you use this software to edit, I mean, yesterday it took me, I want to say six hours to upload a 45 minute video of, you know, just me talking. Not as if there were a lot of effects and a lot of complicated edits, but just for it to transfer from my laptop to YouTube took about six hours, which was kind of just an annoying thing. So if it turns out that I can save myself a little bit of time on the cell phone camera, then I mean, that's just what I'm going to do uh, at this time. And also, I, so also doing, this is also, you know, there are two platforms that you can do this, technically three, right? Because you can access on this on Facebook, you can access this on YouTube, you can access this on my website, publiccomment.blog, um, but I also do podcasting. And for a while, what I've been doing is I have been uploading the video to, oh, what's this, um, to audio online converter. So I would upload the video file to that. That would convert the MP4 to an MP3. Then I could change it to just an MP3 audio and the MP3 audio could then be used as the file for my podcast. But I'm thinking I could probably save a little bit of time by using this voice recorder I have. So we're gonna see how well that works today. The great thing about the digital voice recorder is I can, I mean, I can just literally plug it right into my laptop. It's got a USB connector. So that's pretty cool.
I mean, what remains frustrating to me is I'm concerned about, I am concerned a little bit about video quality. I want it to look good. I don't want to be so obsessed with video quality that I sacrifice the quality of what I talk about though. Um, so that's what I'm sort of trying to navigate through. If you guys have any feedback on that front, look, the fact is I've ignored technology pretty much my entire life. It's just not my expertise. All things STEM related, I've pretty much just blown off and not because I have any kind of belligerent attitude towards those kind of things. I was just always more of a humanities and social sciences kind of guy growing up. The arts, the liberal arts, the liberal studies. So because you just can't be all things to all people, you can't do all things in the world. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But because that's just the way it is, the STEM subjects have had to undergo, have had to suffer from sacrifice of lacking in my attention to them. Uh, quite an unfortunate thing though, because the statistics are out there. If you want to know where the jobs are going to be in the next several decades, it's going to be in technology and STEM related fields. So it, it does occur to me that I'm going to want to know a little bit more about these different things. I was talking to you yesterday about how I just taught myself through watching YouTube videos and reading articles and things, how the internet actually works. So I'm thrilled to have that understanding. However, at this point now, I've got to figure out what is the single best way to record those video blogs and what's the best way to upload them from source to source. And the same thing with the podcasting. So that's sort of an intro to what I have to say about technology. Other than that, it's extremely exotic to me. It's like another country because I, like I said, it suffered from my neglect and I just want to improve that. So now at night, instead of reading from Tolstoy, I'm reading these technology websites and these video blogging websites and all these things to find out how exactly it is that they work, which is cool. Uh, so I apologize for the uh there. At this point though, I want to move on and start talking about interests in general and determining in life what it is that we find interesting. And I use technology as a segue there because technology is utterly fascinating. And I'm mad at myself, in fact, for having waited until now at 33 years old and 2019, we're almost halfway. Can you believe we're almost halfway into 2019 already? Talk about a year that has just zoomed by. I've just not even gotten over January yet. So here I am trying to wrap my mind around technology, but the question has to be raised. How much time am I supposed to spend day to day concentrating on learning more about the advances in technology and how I can apply them to things like my WordPress, WordPress blogging platform or linking videos on my social media, live streaming those videos or editing my YouTube videos, etc making my podcast sound better, or just learning more about various advances that are going on, just because it's good to know what's going on in the world, because this enables one to get a fuller sense of life. I've talked in other videos about how I do strive to be this well-rounded person, this holistic person, However, I read this really interesting article today from 
fastcompany.com. First time I'd ever come across this particular website. And there was a principle suggested on this website that struck me and it's something that I have to grapple with. And this principle was, it said, you have to make peace with incomplete knowledge. So I see that that's what I have to do. Speaking of technology and all of that, if you'll forgive me, I'm just gonna make sure that this is working. I need to do these little sound tests from time to time because I suffer from paranoia. So, so perfect. I see that that's what I have to do. I, again, I apologize there, ladies and gentlemen. Just wanted to make sure that it worked. So I accept the fact, or I'm trying to teach myself how to accept the fact that I just can't pay attention to everything. I just can't spend all day learning everything. I've got to decide what are the things that I just don't want to go without learning about. And if you've checked out my website, publiccomment.blog, you'll see there are three major categories that I tend to stay focused on. And as it turns out, they do definitely delineate the three things that matter most to me. Those three things being politics, culture, and introspection. Now, I think that my interest in politics probably speaks for itself, meaning any of you who actually know me at this point know that the last eight years of my life or so have been in large part dedicated to various forms of political activism. However, there are other things in the world. Another thing that really interests me is culture. And what's so interesting about culture, oh no, my computer just shut down. That's okay. I, I've got my phone on, so that's just fine. Um, but what I love about culture is the fact that culture is really wide. As I understand culture, there are different definitions of the concept, but the way I understand culture and when I have students, how I like to help them understand culture is ultimately culture very, very similar to economy in my opinion, except if economy concentrates more on the concept of resources, I still feel that, or it's still my understanding rather, that culture has a lot to do still, in fact, with production and consumption, or just things that we put our attention on, things that we do, and the values we hold, and all of these various different aspects of our thinking. I believe that culture has a lot to do with philosophy and practice of philosophy or ideology. I think they're very, very similar, except I think that culture also incorporates what, what are the manifestations of the ideologies that we hold. So what's so fun about contemplating the day to day experience of life from a cultural perspective is to sort of ask at different points. What are the philosophical principles that seem implied based on, you know, the kind of cars people are driving or the way a certain geographical area appears to be utilized by a particular community? Sense of aesthetics that I have, a sense of values are there. Is it a city or municipality that looks neglected? that is suffering from poverty, or is there a suggestion that you just live in an apathetic area? That tends to be what I feel about East Windsor, New Jersey, where I currently live. It comes across kind of apathetic. There are a lot of lawns that are never cut, a lot of branches that are always tangled into power lines, a lot of abandoned buildings and things like that. Just gives you the impression that people aren't taking care of the community. So there is a, that's a geographical concept, it's an aesthetics concept, 
Uh, it's also a philosophical concept and it's also a cultural concept. And culture moves in different ways too, because it could be about poetry or one of the other arts, or it could be about what's on in entertainment. It could be about, you can thrust right back into politics. So I really like how wide and vast and philosophical and entrenched in applied philosophy culture tends to be based on how I understand it. So as I try to contemplate how I'm going to spend my time every day, while it's definitely important that I get my political news, and I think at least an hour ought to be spent getting the top stories of the day, and at least understanding a piece of a top story every day, you know, front page story on, in the New York Times or the Washington Post or what have you, to me that seems essential. But also, I think it's also important to understand just what's going on around you beyond the more visceral, immediate, breaking news type political thing. So it could be, again, for me today, the interest in technology is actually very cultural. To what degree do people take an interest in technology, both as consumers and as producers and as people who do or don't know a certain amount about that uh, type of technological product. Some people are Luddites. Uh, even people I know and love, I think, are people who tend to be detached from technology and are not interested. I have two friends who have been very stubborn with respect to the whole cell phone, smartphone thing, two of them have refused to get smartphones, preferring their flip phones from what, like 2008 or what have you. My friend, one of my friends just recently wised up and got a smartphone. I don't know if I've seen my friend's smartphone yet, and I'm not going to name names in this situation without the permission of this particular friend. So. That'll be that. So you see, culture, culture is very liberating to be interested in it because I think that you can sort of move around. And my other major interest is introspection, if that hasn't been obvious. However, I can't put enough emphasis on the importance of introspection. I think everybody ought to take an interest in introspection. Because, to, what, what is that expression, know thyself? Or if you don't know yourself, then you don't understand perhaps aspects of unhappiness that you might experience, or you don't understand why you don't feel more fulfilled, or you're negating perhaps things that are more interesting to you than you realized, or maybe you're in a relationship you really shouldn't be in. I do believe it would be a theory of mine that a lot of people are in failing relationships simply because they don't really know themselves that well or they're not true to themselves. I mean, I saw the situation with my father. He was in three failed marriages despite being a, an expert in marriage and writing a book on the topic. And uh, theoretically, saving numerous marriages, I was told at his, his wake. Uh, may he rest in peace, as the expression goes. However, if you consider my father's relationship with my former stepmother, what an interesting thing, because my father was unpolitical, whereas my stepmother was extraordinarily political. Also, my father was, um, my father was, even though he wasn't political to the best of my understanding, he was a sort of default or de facto Democrat, whereas my former stepmother was a considerably hardcore Republican, considerably conservative. So how did a considerably conservative person and someone who was, certainly my father was hyper liberal culturally, uh, the, however, unpolitical he may have been. 
just to give you an idea of exactly how liberal my father was, I mean, this is the guy who, when we're together as a family at the restaurant, very close to other people in the background there, my father was the one who would say, so I just bought a pornography film the other day called Daddy's Dirty Videos. And he, he would say this in a really sort of uninhibited way, not really caring how other people in the background might react. That's, that's how liberal my father is. My father also wants, and it seems to be a thrill he had to say this at restaurants because I remember another sort of assertively sexual comment that he made uh, towards the end of his life, actually. We were at this Irish restaurant in Trenton, and I don't remember exactly why he said it or what the context was, but I, at some point my father advertised the notion that perhaps he was a trisexual because he would try anything at least once. He didn't elaborate, and I mean, at the time, I wasn't terribly interested in his elaborating, so that would be that. But again, my stepmother, former stepmother, on the other hand, she was staunchly conservative. I can give, at least superficially, in terms of how she presented herself, I mean, maybe, maybe she was, in fact, not so conservative as she wanted people to think she was. Nonetheless, I remember, I think we were in Cape Cod. I was, oh, don't remember how, I was pretty darn young, 11, 12. And I remember getting out of the car and I remember saying the word sexual. And she said something like, don't you ever say that. Some kind of, she, she in some way, shape or form, wanted to express that she wasn't wanting me to use the word sex. And so that became my notion of her. In contrast to my father, who my father had, uh, goodness, I can remember one time, it would have been in fourth grade. This is before I really knew what pornography was. I was in fourth grade searching for where the where the hidden Christmas presents or birthday presents might be and found this closet and I was convinced this is where the presents would be and I found these shocking videos of naked people and things that would uh, imagery that would immediately make this uh, video blog intended for a much more mature audience that at this point in time I'm not gonna I'm not gonna delve into it we'll just put it at this it was shocking and I didn't even fully comprehend what it was I was looking at and there were troves of these videos with these pornographic video covers there, there were these big garbage bags that were either black or white garbage bags, just piles of pornography. So my father was extraordinarily, extraordinarily liberal, at least socially, compared to my stepmother. But my point being, though, why did they get married? And how well did they really know themselves when at the end of the day, their marriage ended in divorce. Was it a self-destructive thing? Did they both consider that their divorce might be inevitable? And that this was just a temporary thing because neither of them wanted to be alone? It's very tough for me to wrap my mind around how that marriage worked. And it's too bad that I don't have a relationship with my former stepmother because I have loved to ask, though I respect that it's a personal thing anyway. Isn't it strange how I think with parents and understanding, especially I believe in the case of when your parents get divorced, 
there's this sense almost of entitlement that you're entitled to understand why the marriage failed. Not, not that I say there's this conviction, this certainty, or this absolute knowledge that indeed it's rational to say that you're entitled to understanding the divorce, but to me it seems such a reasonable curiosity on the one hand, and yet a violation of your parents' privacy on the other hand. Even the divorce, you know, my mother divorcing my father, that's not something I've ever entirely understood. It's also not something I've ever, I've not interrogated my mother about it. I've asked questions about it when I was a little bit younger, probably a teenager or a young adult, younger adult, 33 now, can you believe it? Uh, I think in my earlier 20s, I probably raised some questions about it, but certainly in recent times I haven't, because to me it feels like I'd be violating my mother's privacy. There are things about her life that there's no reason for me to know it's her life, not mine. She doesn't owe me her life story. On the other hand, there is something to me that's just psychologically jarring about the, the dramatic and serious event that is the divorce of, a, of your parents, at least in the context of our times where we do have this notion where you're supposed to have two parents who are in perhaps likely a monogamous relationship and you think that they're supposed to be married or a lot of us believe in marriage. And so when that marriage doesn't work and there's a fracture in this other, what was a conventional notion of being raised and uh, by your parents, you get confused and you want to understand it. I think, moreover, there is this fear that somehow you don't want to repeat the same mistakes and you fear either that there's going to be a genetic predisposition or you spend so much time with your parents that you just, through conditioning, tend to acquire some of their characteristics. And so these things lead you to wonder. Why did my parents get divorced? Because and other, if I don't know, what's the risk that I'm going to contribute to something that similarly will, would cause my own divorce? Something certainly I absolutely don't want to happen. And again, introspection here. Thinking about a marriage, how can you possibly allow, how can you possibly allow is not the word, how, how can you possibly preserve and maintain something as complex and deep and sacred like a marriage if you don't possess the capacity to introspect and ask yourself, am I happy? Am I, do I believe I'm being treated well? Do I believe I'm treating my lover well, my spouse the right way? Uh, are there, uh, am I giving my spouse enough space? Is my spouse giving me enough space? Are we both healthy? And I think also, as I understand it, similar to meditation, there's something about introspection for me there's no peace in the day, no sense of purification, no sense of self without taking that time to step back and evaluate the computer files on my mind, if you will, the most prominent and utilized computer files in my mind if I may use that analogy. So I believe that 
talking a lot about introspection, both as a subject in general, but also introspecting and sharing introspection. I think this is the value, for example, that literature and art, all of the arts, I believe, including aspects of multimedia platforms. I believe that the appeal is if I'm listening to someone else or watching someone else introspect or reading someone else and their introspection, it kind of helps me introspect. I can ask if I relate and why or why not. So I feel that there's a, there's a benefit there. And that would be the rationale behind why I like to fixate so much on introspection. And it's a thing that I believe for a significant chunk of time, I didn't do enough of, which would be ironic because when I was younger, I introspected all the time. Of course, the difference is when I was younger, I introspected very impulsively fixating on what thoughts are in my mind and how am I feeling, but not, I never asked why, I never asked if they were rational. Now, for me, it's important to understand, first of all, like basic themes or categories that are again, dominating my thought sequences, if you will, and asking whether the assumptions behind them and evaluating whether those assumptions are right or wrong and what kind of feelings are there. So that's what I want to say for the day about introspection. There's one last basic category that I want to talk to you about today, and that is friendship. This is going to be a little bit uh, more, this is going to be more of an emotional conversation and a little bit more difficult for me to delve into. But I would tell you this. I've lost, or it seems as though, at times, as if I have lost some extraordinarily precious friendships. And there's no other way to put it than the fact that I cannot help but lament as much. I can't name names, nor can I assume necessarily that these friendships are lost. That's sort of the strange thing about losing touch with people, is part of you may be wondering, I know in my case, I'm wondering, is it me? Is there something about me that caused these relationships, these, these friendships to result in less time together, less conversation? I can think of, off the top of my head, I can think of two very particular friendships I had that were very deep, especially during adolescence, later adolescence into my early 20s. These friendships were really paramount to, to my life story. And as it is currently, both of these friends, well, I have called them on the cell phone numerous times, I've left voicemails numerous times, I've emailed them numerous times, I've tried to get in touch with them in every possible way that I could, as many times as I could without coming across as annoying. And at some point it occurs to you, either these people are drastically busy, or these people really want nothing to do with you, or they wish that they could talk to you, but for whatever reason, they don't know what to say to you. I mean, grappling with the appearance of terminated friendships when, when they didn't, when the friendship didn't end because of a fight, but you just find yourself no longer talking, you find yourself trying to be the one that starts the conversations, but they don't want to um, reciprocate. But I tell you, that's sort of an awful feeling to have when you're the one that's trying to 
keep the friendship, the, that, the substance of that friendship and the, con the, uh, the thrills of the conversations that perpetuate and add zest to those friendships. When you're the one who's trying to keep that going, to keep that fire uh, burning, but they're not. And again, you wrap your mind around it. Is it, is there something wrong with me? Am I that off-putting? Why am I so off-putting? So as it is, I've tried to figure out what could it be that's most off-putting about me? And by the way, there's also a really ironic thing about it because I'm not all that convinced that I'm actually a good friend. I think I have good intentions. I would argue to you I have wonderful intentions. That is to say, I want the best for everybody that I know. Moreover, there are people that I've established really deep connections and relationships with, but I just don't check up on them as much as I do. Sometimes I get a text message and I don't respond to it immediately. Sometimes you say, okay, I know I want to respond to this text message later, and I will. And then maybe a day goes by, two days go by, and you realize you haven't done that. But isn't it funny how, how life is that way? Now, it didn't always seem that way. I know when I was younger, before text messages were the, one of the major ways to keep in touch with people, I can remember, you know, you did the instant messenger, AOL instant messenger. And I think you kind of just didn't really talk to someone if they weren't someone you didn't want to talk to, or if you're already juggling too many other uh, conversations at the same time. But suddenly we get to this point where between your Facebook newsfeed, uh, your Facebook Messenger, your Twitter, your Snapchat, the TV on in the background, and your text messages, your email, if I didn't already say that, I mean, and your Skype, WhatsApp, etc. You're getting all these different messages from people and as you're trying to juggle your day, some of these messages get put on hold. Some of them you didn't mean for them to be put on hold, but for a variety of reasons, they were put on hold. I don't know about you. Sometimes I'm so damn tired that any message on my cell phone or computer is pushed to the side and all I want to do is watch TV, Madame Secretary or Schitt's Creek or what else is on that I, I'd rewatch an episode of Frasier, perhaps, if I could. Bottom line there is that sometimes I just push my friends aside. I know, uh, hey, Bernard, if you're watching, I, I got your email. My friend Bernard sent me some poetry of his that's so brilliant that I've been meaning to really ingest and absorb and contemplate. However, I get so concerned about my, the possibility that I, I could have a career in video blogging or writing, plus, well, you know, actually trying to get some kind of job that pays significantly more than the little bit of money that I'm making now as a tutor, no disrespect to Mercer County Community College or the taxpayers of New Jersey or anything, but it doesn't exactly it doesn't exactly throw me into the middle class and I was hoping to do that. So sometimes when you're really stressed out trying to, to find a job, a lot of other things get pushed to the side, family and friends being one of them. So as I think about those friend friendships that I have that seem to be deep, Deep underground, actually, I was going to say far behind, I'm going to say deep underground. Is it the fact that, I mean, we're young. I'm thinking about my generation. Uh, we millennials, I'm 33, so the people that I went to school with are about 33, 32, 31, 30, right? A lot of us are dealing with still establishing ourselves in our careers, parenthood and marriage and family life and trying to keep in touch with 
those friends that were closest to at work or geographically. And these things happen, right? Geographically, even in general, I think two things that seem to really put a damper on the friendships that I've had in the past, geography and life interests. And not just life interests, but even if you have the same interests, but your interests weren't the same at the same time, it's as if you lose touch. You know, I have friends who are also writers, but those, I just don't enjoy the correspondences with those friends anymore. They were more into writing this or that when I wasn't as into writing this or that, so we perhaps didn't have as much to talk about. What keeps the glue of friendship alive? What do you do? What, what is it that, that determines which friendships will last? Is another way of asking the same question. Certainly, I want to say to any of you who consider us friends, if, if there's anything I've done that you believe has been in any way, shape, or form destructive to the connections and the relationships we have, I want you to know I'm extraordinarily sorry and that I never meant to say anything that would make you feel bad. I never meant to do anything that would suggest anything other than my deep love for you. It really is an awful thing to think about the friendships that we've lost. There were two friendships I had in particular I was telling you about through adolescence and into my early 20s. It's, uh, do you ever, do you know the song by the Dire Straits, Romeo and Juliet? There's this great line where he says, when you're going to realize it's just the time was wrong. That's how I feel about these two friends. I wish I could tell you their, their names for the sake of like telling a good story, but I've got to respect the privacy of these two individuals. However, I would tell you that I would say that um, it's too bad that I was closest perhaps with these two individuals when I was at my worst, when I was going through this awful self-loathing, ironic hippie thing, irrationalism, bad attitude, always wanting to start an argument, wanting to come across as the crazy, wild Jim Morrison wannabe guy or whatever. And just saying stupid things, saying whatever came to my mind as opposed to saying anything rational. I don't know, I don't, I, I can't even fully wrap my mind around the damage I may have done to those friendships. But again, I want to say sorry and I want to say if there's anything I could do to repair them. Of course I want to. But I mean, sometimes the inevitable thing is that we just grow apart. Brought up geography or just the fact that we change. I know that on my part, when I was 25, 26, 27, I got deeply into politics and fell away from the arts and even felt away, felt, felt far from at various points, even some of the more esoteric and academic aspects of philosophy. I know that like a year ago, two years ago, I slipped out of being as consistently political as I was even earlier, before, right before that little time segment, and delved really deep into academia. And so when you're deeply academic, right, then you're going to start establishing these relationships that are 
more revolving around academic connections and conversations. So these things that which we interest, which interest us so much, when we have these connections and these friendships, but then we change, then sometimes all of a sudden we find ourselves with less to talk about. Do you guys watch Frasier? One of my favorite TV shows. There's this great episode. So if you're familiar with Frasier, you might also have to be familiar with Cheers, the spinoff that Frasier came from to fully appreciate this. So Woody and Frasier are both friends on Cheers. Cheers ends and Frasier is the new show. Woody's not part of the show. But then Woody comes as a guest star at some point, sort of in the, the middle of Frasier's 11 year run. And Frasier and Woody catch up and, oh, it's so great to see each other and spend time with each other and bump into each other this way until they realize we have nothing in common. We have nothing to talk about. We don't even really like spending time with each other. Uh, this friendship isn't what our nostalgia led us to believe it was. And so they find that they have that much in common and I'll see you 10 years from now and we'll talk about the same thing. It was great but I don't really have anything else in common with you. You're a, a common person who doesn't really care about anything academic and I'm up my wazoo in my own brilliance kind of a thing, right? And that's what can happen. Those are just, those are just some of the aspects contributing to some of the friendships I've I've lost, I just want to tell you about one more. This is, uh, so I don't know to what degree you know my overall wider life story, but when I was 21, I ended up at a hostel uh, in Tampa and without any money really. And the fellow who owned the hostel made sure that I always had food to eat and liked to have a lot of conversations with me. And his deal was this. He said, if you share your poetry with me every day and listen to my commentaries on music, you can eat here and you can stay here. And that's how it was for a few months. Anyway, eventually I realized I couldn't live in a hostel and begged my older brother, Matt, God bless his generosity and goodness. He lent me money to fly back home to New Jersey and find an apartment or place to live, a roof over my head and some weeks later, this friend of mine who had looked out for me when I lived in a hostel, he, uh, he hung himself. And I got a phone call about it. Uh, I was told when his funeral would be. Of course, I, I couldn't be there at his funeral. And though I imagine this fellow and I, maybe we wouldn't get along today. He was, talk about radically socially liberal in a way that my father sort of was. This guy was sort of like that too, I would say. Uh, but even, I, I think, radical or to greater degrees. I'll tell you about it sometime in the future, I promise. I believe he claimed that he lost his virginity when he was nine years old. So just to give you an example. And he liked to brag about it. I think the story was quite literally that he had said to this girl, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. That's what I remember him telling me. No joke. Um, when I found out that he killed himself, you can't imagine the guilt and feeling like a failure of a friend for not keeping in touch. So in a lot of ways I have failed as someone who aspires to be a good friend. And in lamenting those friendships that either I've lost or 
friendships that just seem less discernible or friendships that seem for whatever reason it seems to me I get this insecurity that those friendships are no longer there. I lament it and I regret anything on my part that caused that and it's it's one of those things in life you have no choice but to simply grieve over and say, this is sad, but it's a sadness worth feeling. It's a sadness that makes you feel alive. It's a sadness that makes you feel your sense of values, at least. And it's a sadness that hopefully at least motivates you to hold on tighter and closer, be more vigilant to those friendships that you still do have. Hopefully they'll last longer and they'll be stronger. And I'd say you never know with things. So go back into politics and uh, give you a sort of historical reference. You know, there was this interesting relationship between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, two of our founding fathers, as the expression goes, because they were really close during, I believe, that revolutionary period when we were establishing our independence, though as America eventually established its independence and we were just beginning in our early political phase, right? John Adams was more of a Federalist and Thomas Jefferson was more of a let the states just sort of have their own independence and do their own thing, more of a libertarian type of guy. And they were not so close, right? But also, as they were older men, towards the end of their lives, they corresponded with each other through letters and found great meaning and joy in being able to do that. So I think to myself, well, maybe today, those friendships that either I've done something to ruin or subdue, or for whatever reason, those old friends I had just, uh, for whatever reason that I can't wrap my mind around, don't want to take part in this, that old friendship we had in those days, back in those days, uh, or whatever it may be. It's good to, it's good to know that it's, it's always possible that A, there was some more going on in their lives. There's more psychological context than I could ever wrap my mind around. And there was never so much to worry about and just let them have their space. What question? Oh, I lost. I hope I didn't just lose all of that. That would be too bad. Um, what's that expression? If you love her let her go if she comes back then you know I know that that's attributed more to romantic love but I suppose that you could say that that has something to do with just people in general and so maybe that's the case also in friendship and so maybe I find that friendships that appeared lost today will reemerge again in the future and I will leave you with that thought. I did want to talk about free trade versus protectionism today, but I see that I'm, I, I do like to keep these under an hour. And plus they say, save things for a rainy day. More that I could say about the topic later. I don't like to overdo things. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch or listen. If you've enjoyed this, video blog or podcast. I encourage you to check out other ones. 
you can find me on you find my website on publiccomment.blog. You can check me out on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. And you can see me on Spotify and other platforms where podcasts are. And I thank you again. If you did find this to be meaning, a meaningful thing, also I hope that you would share with uh, your favorite people. I look forward to chatting with you again really soon. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye.